pleasure to have our speaker for tonight here with us. He served on, about four or five years ago, served on the State of Indiana Committee, which uh, worked to advise the state on the total setup for a College of Architecture and also on the campuses in the state, which ones to consider and for what reasons. George Danforth studied at Armour Institute of Technology in Chicago, which is now Illinois Institute of Technology. His graduate studies were at IIT. He has been on the faculty of the Department of Architecture at IIT over several different periods of time. He's a registered architect in Illinois, Ohio, Iowa, Kentucky, and has his National Council of Architectural Regents of Architecture at Western Reserve University, Cleveland, Ohio, from 53 to 59. In 59, he moved back to IIT as professor and director of the School of Architecture. He is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He's a partner in the firm of Brenner Danforth Rockwell Architects. He has worked in the office of Mies van der Rohe from 39 to 44. He has served as an architectural consultant to U.S. Steel Corporation and architectural consultant to the International Nickel Company. So it's with great pleasure that, that we look forward to his uh, speech on the work of Mies van der Rohe. Mr. Danforth. Thank you, Dean Saffenfield. And ladies and gentlemen, the fact that I was on this um, evaluating committee a few years ago to look at the various sites in the state of Indiana for the location of the new school makes me much more comfortable being here tonight talking than if I were at Purdue <laughs> or any of the others, as a matter of fact. That was uh, an enlightening experience, nevertheless, to see regardless of the fact that the decision was to have the school developed here, School of Architecture and Planning, it was an enlightening experience to see what is happening in the general area of education at the college level within the state of Indiana, particularly those areas that uh, relate to and can be interdependent with the fields and the endeavors of architecture and planning. It was not an easy decision to make for various reasons, which I need not go into tonight since it's not relevant to what I came here for. But I'm glad to be back here and see the school on its way. And having had the opportunity of starting a new program, although not a new department at Western Reserve, I can wish you good luck and uh, Godspeed, etc. Relative to my Comments concerning Nice tonight. I understand that later in the spring there's a group, sophomores, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, um, that are going on a field trip later this year to Chicago, amongst other places. I don't know what the timing of it is, but I think it might be of interest to you to call your attention to the fact that on the 24th or the 25th, I think 25th to the general public of April, there is opening at the Chicago Art Institute an exhibit on the work of Mies van der Rohe. This is the first exhibit that Mies has had uh, since the one in 1947, which was presented by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and uh, which was accompanied, as you uh, probably know in your history and research on contemporary architects by the publication, the first really somewhat definitive publication on Mies, by, uh, edited by Philip Johnson. Philip, who was at that time director of the Department of Architecture of the Museum of Modern Art. So, Jim Rose, a good friend, magnificently, he has installed painting and sculpture exhibits at the Art Institute, and he'll handle this spatial one of architecture equally as well. I hope you'll be able to be there at that time to see it. 
it's worth seeing. It will be not a retrospective of Mises' work, but like my remarks tonight, it will be, um, it will show a few judiciously chosen works of the architect, works which are, as I have tried to show to, have tried to bring to you tonight, which are milestones in his own development, or turning points or milestones which are significant in a particular development, and which really, in essence, point up the character of his work, the development of his work, and the consistency of his architectural endeavor. When do you go, by the way, to Chicago? You haven't set a date. Well, it would be a, an exhibit worth seeing, sure. The comments I've tonight I've put under the title of Concerning Mies van der Rohe. It's certainly involving the work that he has done. It touches upon his educational importance. It draws upon quotes that I think are particularly cogent in bringing out a point or an idea that he has embodied in his work and indeed in his philosophy. As we know, every cultural movement has its leaders. They are the individuals who are unusually imaginative and creative, and by being so, have the power to project themselves beyond the firmly established conventionalities of the milieu in which they live. The presence in any society of these original thinkers is that society's assurance of progression. For only by a constant infiltration of new ideas produced by keenly perceiving innovators can a culture advance. Architecture, as one aspect of the culture of our time, has had four highly creative and prophetic individuals to give it meaning, direction, force, and vitality. Frank Lloyd Wright, a native of America, Le Corbusier, Swiss by birth, French by adoption. Walter Gropius, German-born in Berlin. Mies van der Rohe, born in Germany, lived in Berlin for the most of his European life, and who came to America in 1938, becoming a citizen in 1944. All have made their significant contributions, but it is Mies van der Rohe who has more articulately achieved the reunion of architecture and the means of our time which make architecture possible. In fact, Mies undeniably has made it clear in his work that a new aesthetic is inevitable when a straightforward, ordered, ordered and reasonable use of the structural means available is employed. And he hastens to say that without a collaborating spirit, an expression of any form has no importance, no stability, and no value. And I've heard him comment, too, that this spiritual quality is a very difficult one to attain in our time. Mies knows of what he speaks when he says this, for he is one who developed his art in contact with tradition. Born in Aachen in 1886, his childhood years were spent in that city which was the first capital of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, and was the focus of Western culture in the early Middle Ages. Mies attended the cathedral school in Aachen, founded in the ninth century by Charlemagne, and was profoundly impressed by this environment. The spatial quality of the old city taught him many lessons which are apparent in his work. The varying contrasts between the narrow streets and the open squares. The closed compactness of the walled city and the rolling fields of the lowlands surrounding. And probably most of all, he was filled with wonder by the mysterious beauty of the chapel of Charlemagne, to which he went each morning with his mother for devotion. Mies often refers to the time when, as a child, he wandered into the lower reaches of the chapel and came into a large, empty room lit by a few candles. 
its space punctuated by the simple stone columns whose upper extremities disappeared into the shadows. Here, he later realized, was a superb example of the transformation of the material into the spiritual. Here, he felt, was where structure and space reached its highest value. Mies's father was a master mason, and in his youth, Mies too was an apprentice to a mason. An intuitive craftsman, he brought to architecture the craftsman, craftsman's sure sense of workmanship and values. This is evident in his every building. It must be remembered that such a sense of craftsmanship in Europe is a tradition which goes back to the guilds of medieval times. It is significant that Mies came to building at a time when every building standard was being lowered. His knowing skill showed us how to build again. His boldest buildings, quite in the grand manner of the cathedrals, are all the more convincing of his prudence. Still, even the surest mastery of materials and methods, the deftest touch, the finest feeling for detail, the most fertile fantasy without direction are in themselves only talents, however rare. It is the sense of direction more than anything else which has made possible the development of Mises' architecture. It is, more than anything else, a philosophic development. In his early 20s, Mies worked in the office of one of the foremost masters of the older generation of architects in Germany, Peter Behrens. And he was in close contact with the members of the Dutch school, whose leader was Hendrik Berlag. Of this experience, Mies has said that from Behrens, I learned great form. And from Berlaga, I learned structure. In studying Mises' earlier work, the influence, or his earliest work indeed, the influence of Carl Friedrich Schinkel, who was born in 18, uh, 1781 and died in 1840, and Frank Lloyd Wright are most evident. Schinkel was one of the most important architects of the European Romantic period. His remarkably fine sense of proportion resulted in whatever historical style he used becoming uniquely his own. Schinkel's architecture was a controlled withholding of everything openly dramatic and had a feeling for the clear, careful articulation of the individual elements. Mr. Wright impressed Mies with the idea of the open plan and showed him new plastic means of architectural expression. Mies's entire career has been one which has kept him in touch with others, frequently on an international basis. Often, as in his buildings for some of the great European ex exhibitions of the past decades or for other official representative purposes, Mies had the responsibility not only of showing what he was personally capable of, but of speaking for the group of which he was a member. Such ties and obligations, instead of becoming a hindrance, actually were a challenge to develop what was best in him. His later activity as a teacher, first in Germany, in his own atelier, as well as at the Bauhaus, for he was the last director, and from 1938 to 1957 in Chicago at uh, Illinois Tech, seems to have urged him in the same direction. That is, to develop his personality in clarifying for himself the essentials of sound architecture. It is this stress on essentials which gives the individual mark to Mises' architecture an individual note which is sustained as sustained and forceful as it is inconspicuous. His work betrays character rather than personal color. His work is utterly new 
without being novelty or without being of a fashion or trying to create one. The first impression of his buildings is that of utmost simplicity. Only gradually does the observer become aware of the fact that this simplicity is the consequence of a long process of thinking, planning, and organizing, of the most painstaking workmanship at each stage in the progress of work, in each drawing, each model, not to mention the final product, of the most conscientious use of technical methods, of materials, of external conditions. In short, of a most complex process of formulating a problem and solving it in all its aspects in the most thorough manner. <clears throat> the great personal qualities which manifest themselves in his work are extreme seriousness, devotion to a task, an almost ascetic modesty, and an incorruptible honesty. Mies displays no self-indulgence. He yields in no way to whimsy and has no goal of self-advertisement through the use of individualistic frills or spectacular idiosyncrasies. His buildings are certainly no food for people spoilt by modern flashiness or sensationalism. They are severe even to a kind of ruggedness. And yet careful study reveals the finest and most noble proportions, textures, and color schemes. They are extremely usable and livable for people of good, healthy tastes. May we have the lights, please, and the first slide? <clears throat> I'll leave the focusing up to you since I don't see it quite as clearly. When Mies was about 19, and before he worked in the office of Peter Behrens in Berlin, he apprenticed for two years in the office of Bruno Paul, who was then considered one of Germany's outstanding furniture designers. Here, Mies's training in wood craftsmanship added to his knowledge of the use and detailing of materials. It was two years later, in 1907, that he built this, his first house, the real house in Berlin. It was done in the manner of the then fashionable 18th century style. There were gables and dormer windows and steep roofs which were characteristic of the style. And only the fine proportions and meticulous craftsmanship differentiated it from its contemporaries. In 1912, after Mies left Barron's office, he entered a competition for a monument to the 19th century statesman Bismarck, which shows his indebtedness to the work of Schinkel. The site, as you can tell from this rendering, was an imposing one, and although traditional elements are used, they are shorn of their applied ornamentation, reduced to their essentials, and refined in their proportions. Can you see on this side by me okay? After four years in the Army, Mies, in 1919, did the design of a house for the Kempner family, again in Berlin. Again, it shows the influence of Schinkel. It was not built, and it was the last romantic work that he did. From about this point on, Mies revealed those architectural qualities by which we identify his work today. His projects 
for steel and glass buildings and for an office building in concrete demonstrates a well-expressed grasp of the essentials of the materials he uses. The steel buildings, I'm backing up here purposefully, um, are light and elegant, as you can see in this rendering. This was a competition of a building on the Friedrichstrasse in, in Germany. They are light and elegant, almost ionic in architectural character, as has been observed by Dr. Hilbersheimer, in contrast to what he feels is the Doric character of the heavier appearing concrete buildings. This is the plan of that previous structure. And this is the building, which was of that same period of projects which Dr. Hilbersheimer has spoken of as being more Doric in character. <clears throat> Both of these two projects, nevertheless, express the inherent qualities of the different materials transformed into architectural values. According to Mies, this at first was an instinctive action. In 1926, Mies became president of a group composed of architects and industrialists known as the Deutsche Werkbund, founded with the express aim of improving the quality of industrial design in Germany to compete more successfully with the then more efficient and progressive English. This group sponsored an exhibition of houses known as the Weisenhofsiedlung in Stuttgart, Germany in 1927. The city itself financed the project, which was under Mises' direction and at whose invitation approximately 17 of Europe's leading modern architects submitted work for the development. This Mises' own building was an apartment house within which only the kitchens, bathrooms, and stairs were fixed elements, leaving the other spaces free to be subdivided according to the occupant's needs. Mies suggested variations upon two apartment types utilizing two and three bays, respectively, of this a ski, uh, steel skeleton building. This is the reverse side of the previous one. A building which, along with a number of others at the, uh, in the area of the Weisenhof Siedlung, still stands and is taken care of by the city of Stuttgart. As two of Corbu's buildings, Mark Stamm, Hilbersheimer's building is still there, and a few of the uh, great names that participated in this uh, exhibition. <clears throat> in the area of exhibitions, Mises' concern and mastery of concept and detail is as evident as in his architecture. In his earliest exhibitions, the first being for the Werkbund in Stuttgart in 1927, each object was treated with a new respect. The materials exhibited frequently determined the architectural arrangements, such as walls of glass, in this the glass exhibit, as well as here, silk in the silk exhibit, and so forth. It was in many such exhibitions, as well as on the interiors of some of Mises' residences of this period, that he had the collaboration of an extremely gifted interior designer and architect by the name of Lily Reich. Before her association with the architect, she conducted a dress design studio in Frankfurt, and after Mies became director of the Bauhaus, in 1930, he appointed Lily Reich to be in charge of the weaving studios. Mises' concern with every detail and object resulted in his first chair done for the Exposition de la Mode in Berlin in 1927. It is known as the MR chair. Of tubular cantilever construction, it has been a chair widely copied and miscopied. In the fall of 1947, the Museum of Modern Art 
presented a major exhibition of the work of Mies, as I mentioned earlier. Which exhibit was totally designed by him? In writing on it in Arts and Architecture, Charles Eames spoke thusly. And I quote Eames here. The Mies van der Rohe show itself is not a complete presentation of his work, and most of the few examples shown have been seen many times before. But somehow or other, this does not detract in any way from its greatness. The significant thing seems to be the way in which he has taken documents of his architecture and furniture and used them as elements in creating a space that says, this is what it's all about. Certainly it is the experience of walking through that space and seeing others move in it that is a high point of the exhibition. He continues by saying it comes off wonderfully in so many ways. In the sense of volume, in the sudden change of scale from a huge photo mural of a small pencil sketch to quarter inch to the foot model, to man, to twice life-size photograph, to actual pieces of furniture. In the simultaneous effect when the natural perspective of the planes of the room are combined with the perspective and planes of the life-sized photographs. And especially in the variety and richness of the exhibition derived from the simplest plan. By moving and turning within these simple elements, one feels the impact of each new relationship. This experience forms a frame of reference from which the history of Mies van der Rohe's work can be examined. And end of the quote. <clears throat> Mies's most famous and exquisite building was the German pavilion at the Barcelona Ex International Exposition in 1929. The very fact that its function was but that of a pavilion allowed Mies to employ an almost abstract approach to its planning. In this pavilion, he made his most conclusive statement on the architectural character of the open plan. His reputation of the understanding of space as an architectural factor of expression was firmly established by this building. And it must not be overlooked that such a clear manifestation of space concept could not have been achieved without his understanding use of the steel skeleton structure. For it must be kept in mind that the very root of Mises' architectural philosophy is that architecture is the logical outgrowth of our structural methods. Between the two horizontal planes of floor and ceiling, the vertical planes or the walls were disposed of in a surprising way. They were differentiated in material, size, and proportions. Their purpose was to divide the enclosed space and at the same time unite it visually. Moving about within the structure, one was surprised by the unexpected. What one saw was both simple and complex. Richness was there through the use of elegant materials and through the succession of different spaces, none closed, all leading from one to another and finally merging with the exterior space of the garden in which the pavilion was sited. This work united the rational of the structure with the irrational of the space, or with the irrational, I should say, of the space concept resulting in a real architectural work of art. Like the building for which it was designed, the Barcelona chair, and indeed all of Mises' furniture, shows painstaking attention to detail. Chrome-plated spring steel frame, saddle leather supporting straps, welted calfskin cushions. This is the original chair, which has a much heavier weld and fillet here than those which have perfected a more sophisticated joining technique. 
eliminating it entirely. <clears throat> in the German pavilion, Mies also sought and found a way to use works of art in connection with his architecture. Never one to degrade art to mere decoration, but by using sculpture as an equal means, he enriched both art and architecture. <clears throat> the same silk industry for which Mies had done numerous exhibits that I showed you some of the slides earlier, commissioned him in 1937 to prepare plans for an administration building to be built in Krefeld, Germany. The impending war, however, prevented this project from ever being realized. And in mid-1938, Mies came to America to, an accept, to accept an offer from Armour Institute of Technology in Chicago to be director of its Department of Architecture. His first commission in America was to design, was to design a house for a Mr. and Mrs. Stanley B. Rezor in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Mr. Rezor was the president of the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency. It was a house which was built over a small stream in addition to living and sleeping quarters for the immediate family, provided a meeting and dining space for as many as 20 to 25 guests. It was really kind of a club, and the guests lived in smaller houses on the estate, would come there to dine. The war again stopped this project. It was never built. Soon after Mies assumed directorship of the department, the Institute's president, Henry T. Heald, brought to him the task of being architect for a completely new physical plant. Of Mr. Heald's 14 years as president of the Institute, Dr. Robert Hutchison, Hutchins, rather, then president of the University of Chicago, has said he did something quite remarkable and unexpected. He made the Institute significant in Chicago and in education. But by commissioning Mies in 1939 to plan and build a new campus, Heald contributed to the importance of the school from an architectural and planning viewpoint as well. It was an astute judgment showing respect for the practical capabilities of the man in whose trust he had placed the educational development of the school's students of architecture. Is that sharp? Mies developed the plan with extreme care. He is quoted as saying, it was the biggest decision I ever had to make. It was more than 10 years ago that we started building, and by now it was all supposed to be finished. But of course it will be another 10 to 12 years yet. And you know, he continues, if you build one building, you can go away and leave it. But 25 years is a long time these days, and I know our, build, our way of building had to reach across this time and not become out of style. A basic module of planning had to be found which would be suitable for the principal requirements of a school, to contain the offices, the classrooms, the laboratories, and the drafting rooms, and the lecture halls. Much investigation resulted in a 24-foot square bay as the module. This 24-foot grid was superimposed upon the site and affected not only the buildings themselves, but the spaces between them. It has a further function, as Professor Hilbersheimer points out in his book on Mies, that it prevents decisions to locate buildings under the pressure of certain needs, which might disadvantageously affect the order of the whole. In this scheme, I might point out, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the area. This is 33rd Street running west. This is State Street to the north to my right. There was a street in here which was proposed to be closed. Therefore, the lecture halls were placed outside of the buildings in many cases. <coughs> this first scheme, which as I say, proposed closing Dearborn, made possible a grouping of the various departmental buildings about a large central open area, available only to the pedestrian. 
The openness of the central core was extended visually beyond its physical limits by freeing the ground floors of surrounding buildings of all but stair entrances, locker spaces, and glass enclosed lounge areas. The refusal of the city at that time to permit the closing of Dearborn necessitated the development of a second scheme, much as we know the central area of the campus today. You're looking in the opposite direction now. State Street is running along here to the north. Here again is 33rd, that being to the east, of course. This scheme, as you can see, resulted in this central area, the core of our campus, and other created smaller areas around which the, it's reduced in size and created other areas, again somewhat reduced in size, uh, around which the buildings are grouped. The varying heights and the widths and depths of the individual buildings and the varying measurements of the free spaces provided an intended interplay between the alternating open and closed spaces. Seen in their interrelations as you walk through the campus, they are much less static in effect than a photograph of a model might lead one to assume. The first building on the new campus was also the architect's first building to be completed in America. It's the Metals and Minerals Building. Its steel frame, and filled with brick and glass, is as eloquently true to its purpose as, for example, the English half-timber structures of the Middle Ages are true to theirs. The members express their purpose in the frame. The studied proportion of the spacing, the size of the members, sufficient to their need, the skill of the joining, never clumsy nor suggesting that grossness so often found today in contemporary architecture. This was Mises' first building on the campus. He says the most difficult one for here, in concept and in every detail, had to be embodied the vocabulary for the future buildings of his campus plan. The chapel on the IIT campus is the first ecclesiastical building done by Mies. Extremely modest in scale, it's but 37 feet wide and 60 feet long and in height 19 feet. Its walls are of buff brick. The interior partitions are of natural finished oak and the altar screen is of a natural colored raw silk in front of which is placed the cross and altar rail of highly polished stainless steel. The altar itself is travertine marble. Mies has the following to say concerning the chapel. I chose an intensive rather than an extensive form to express my conception, simply and honestly of what a sacred building could be. By that I mean a church or chapel should identify itself rather than rely upon the spiritual associations of a traditional fashion in architecture such as the Gothic. But the same motives of respect and nobility are present in both instances. I know there are those who may take exception to the chapel, but it was designed for the students and staff of the school. They will understand it. Architecture should be concerned with the epoch, not the day. The chapel will not grow old. It is of noble character, constructed of good materials, and has beautiful proportions. It is done as things should be done today taking advantage of our technological means. The men who did the Gothic churches achieved the best they could with their means. Too often we think of architecture in terms of the spectacular. There is nothing spectacular about this chapel. It was meant to be sim simple, and in fact, it is simple. But in its simplicity, it is not primitive, but noble. And in its smallness, it is great, in fact, monumental. 
I would not have built the chapel differently if I'd had a million dollars to do it. End of quote. In 1943, the Architectural Forum sponsored a project in its magazine which concerned itself with the design of numerous specific buildings for a small city. They invited different architects to present their ideas on a particular building, and Mies, upon being invited, prepared sketches, uh, sketches for a museum for a small city. <clears throat> the building he created for this project as well as his ideas on museums, can best be described by noting his statement which accompanies these sketches. The museum for a small city should not emulate its metropolitan counterparts. The value of such a museum depends upon the quality of its works of art and the manner in which they are exhibited. The problem is to establish the museum as a center for the enjoyment, not the interment of art. In this project, the barrier between the work of art and the living community is erased by a garden approach for the display of sculpture. Sculpture placed inside the building enjoys an equal spatial freedom because the open plan permits it to be seen against the surrounding hills. <clears throat> The architectural space thus achieved becomes a defining rather than a confining space. A work such as Picasso's Guernica has been difficult to place in the usual muse museum gallery. Here it could be shown to greatest advantage and become an element in space against a changing background. Under the same roof, but separated from the exhibit itself, this would be to your right, would be the offices of administration, which has their own, uh, having their own service and storage facilities in the basement under that particular part. The view you saw before was looking for the entrance in this direction. Small pictures would be exhibited on freestanding walls. The entire building space would be available for larger groups encouraging a more representative use of the museum than it is customary today, and creating a noble background for the civic and cultural life of the whole community. That is his, those are his comments upon this project. It's interesting to note here, too, that over this hall, the elimination of columns, he provided a girder on the roof, which is a precursor, again, of what he has done in some buildings you'll see later. I think that is evident in this view. You can see just the touch of it over the auditorium section to the right. As I say, this is probably the earliest example in that museum uh, project of Mises architecture of placing the structural spanning elements outside the volume of the building to permit an interior space uninterrupted by columns, which he wanted, um, and is carried to a much further degree later, but which he wanted in the auditorium at that time. In the 1946 project for a drive-in restaurant in Indianapolis, Indiana, this concept constituted the total structure of the building, with the roof plane being suspended under the large trusses, which in turn are supported by four columns. And typically Mies, it is the structure which catches the eye, not the usual and ever-present electric sign. In the project for an office building for an insurance company, also in Indianapolis, 49 and 50, can be seen in detail for the treatment of the secondary structure of the building the outer envelope, or the curtain wall as we've come to know it, which he has developed and refined in subsequent work. Mises' first house built in America is one of a concept that is very special and very selective in its appeal. It is a house in a field near a river built for a Dr. Edith Farnsworth. His idea of the relative importance of architecture on the one hand 
and of the individual human being on the other is most forcefully and clearly brought out in this house. An interview with Mies, appearing in the magazine of Building, is quoted as saying, Mies is convinced that the architecture should be no more than the shell within which each occupant produces his or her own dwelling. To put it another way, no romantic self-portraits of the architect, no inflexible portrayals of clients, who in the long view may turn out to have been only temporary tenants. Mies believes that his architecture must be objective, impersonal, a quiet and simple space, a backdrop against which each individual in all human life in its great complexities can develop freely and develop in changing ways from generation to generation. Ending that magazine's quote. There is an almost jewel-like perfection to the house, not only in the workmanship, in the detail and simplicity of concept, but in its very setting amongst the trees, which recalls that very special relationship of the house to its setting as found in some Japanese architecture. The house is in fact a recall of certain qualities of the pavilion at Barcelona. Although here it is a one-room glass shell suspended above or supported above the ground on eight steel columns with the only element between the glass enclosure being the long, narrow service core which contains the bathrooms and the utilities, a large kitchen and a fireplace. Although Mises' philosophy of a building's form reflecting its structure is now sufficiently understood to have changed the appearance of most of our new buildings of any importance, it was a principle not easily assimilated. People were just not used to seeing steel and concrete, and when he first put it into view, it was an understandable shock. The 860, 880 apartment buildings built in 1951 are two structures within the vernacular of skyscraper whose influence is literally universal. There is scarcely an architect who deals with a building of vertical proportions who can now afford to overlook their lesson. In the hands of Mies, the skeleton always reveals in the clearest way the principle of its structure. There is visual delight in the slimness of the columns and the delicate mullions, and in their use of the means and methods of the industrial process. These buildings are a high act of courage, committing us to the living present. In the early 1930s, Mies created a series of projects for courthouses in which the space of a house and its property is confined within the wall surrounding the property, which defines the periphery of the lot. These are the courts on either side. It's not course house in the judicial sense, it's houses with courts. Not a new idea. The Greeks, as we know, have had them for a long time, but it's in a modern idiom. Such a concept allows complete utilization of the property for its occupants and permits a much greater freedom of arrangement within since the enclosing peripheral walls afford total privacy. And we now see a perspective from in here looking into this space. Which shows how a wall might be treated as a mural. Besides the sociological implications of such a concept, which may or may not have been a major concern of his at that time, these important projects served in providing the opportunity of further exploring the problem of the open plan, which had been dealt with in his earlier 1923 project for a brick country house, and of course, which was brilliantly uh, presented and brought to focus and, and crystallized very well indeed in the German pavilion. In 1953, Mies was invited to participate in a competition project for a theater and concert hall in Mannheim, Germany. The result was a solution which is grand in concept and which does not conform to established traditional ideas of what a theater should look like. 
That is to say, the stage and the auditorium no longer determine the form of the building, but are placed within the huge column-free hall within which the functional elements can be developed as their need exists without interference from the structure. The building had two auditoriums in, within it. One was a small theater seating 500 people, and this into which you are looking is a larger hall of about 1,500 or 2,000 people. The main floor, and that was the inn that you were looking into a moment ago, the outer walls of which, as you see, are recessed from the columns and are of marble. It contains the entrance halls for the larger and the smaller theaters, the foyers, the dressing rooms, the rehearsal rooms in the center, workshops, storage space, studios, offices, cafeterias, and kitchens, and those sort of services. Coming up the stairs, in either case, then, you come to the second floor, which contains the auditorium. And the stages and the dressing rooms and promenades and restaurants and, again, more workshops. The span of the trusses, the great trusses, is 226 feet, and the overall length of the building is 536. And the trusses and their uh, uh, supporting columns are set at approximately 80-foot intervals, which will give you some idea of the scale of the building. And going back now again to show you how he's treated the seating element itself in the main auditorium, it is indeed a cantilever from the bottom, quite free in its back part, quite open. Also in 1953, <clears throat> the Chicago South Side Planning Board proposed a scheme by Mies for a Chicago Convention and Exhibition Hall. Such a building would have to serve an infinite number of uses, and Mies's proposal was for a one-story structure, slightly over 700 feet on the side, and about 100 feet high, which would be entirely free of interior supports. A two-way truss constituted the upper 30 feet of the building, and columns spaced 100-foot intervals around the periphery of the building carried the roof loads. Vertical trusses in the interior walls here, this lower part, were designed to take the wind loads against the wall. The seating capacity was 50,000. Restaurants, meeting and conference rooms, and attended service facilities were proposed in adjoining buildings, as you can see in this collage, accessible by on-the-surface and underground walks. This is at the section of 22nd Street and just about at the lake where McCormick Place was across the way. As you see in these photos of the model, Mies studied the enclosing skin in this particular case, marble, with constant respect to the aesthetic of the structure, placing the material so that the structure itself remains visible from the outside as well as the inside. Many different materials were tried for the skin, with metal, which you see here, being the final decision, for as Mies said, it was more neutral and more in sympathy with the metallic character of the structure itself. Dr. Hilbersheimer, in his book, Mies van der Rohe, has said, like all public buildings, a convention hall must have a social significance. The problem of the architect is to express the significance architecturally. He is also concerned in such a building with the problem of monumentality, since great size is one of the requirements. Dimensional extension alone, however, does not result in monumentality, Hilbersheimer continues. The setting, too, is an essential consideration, as well as the contrast to the surroundings. 
But in the end, the architectural problem of proportion remains all important. Mises' first building in New York City was constructed for the Seagram Distillers. It's a 38-story structure of steel enclosed in a framework of bronze with warm gray tinted glass. As you can see here at the bottom, the building is set back from the property lines of Park Avenue, permitting, permitting the open area to be developed as a plaza, thus being amongst the first, the few new structures in that city recognizing the space in which a building is situated as having an architectural character. With the change. Got my glass there? Yes. With Dr. Hilbersheimer, who, by the way, is an internationally known, he's not living now, he passed away last May, but an internationally known city planner and formerly director of the Department of City and Regional Planning at IIT and a colleague of many years with Mies. Uh, with Mies, Hilps um, designed a redevelopment project in the city of Detroit, originally named Graciot Development and now is known as Lafayette Park. Of this 76-acre project that you see a model of here, uh, which has been almost totally built, Hilp says that the Graciot redevelopment, or the, Lake, or the Lafayette redevelopment project, demonstrates what's, what can be achieved by building on less expensive land, by planning for a larger area, and by mixing tall buildings with low buildings. The larger area, and the mixing of building types makes it possible to place the groups of tall apartment buildings at a considerable distance from one another, as you can see here. The individual apartments benefit by having an unobstructed view, and the settlement as a whole is penetrated by a park, which is its natural recreation area. In Mises' long and consistent architectural career, the most significant building to be built to date is Crown Hall on the campus of Illinois Tech. This great building houses our School of Architecture, Planning, and the Institute of Design, and is the architectural emphasis of the entire campus idea or design. Its structural concept is that of an all steel and glass building of such a system which permits the main floor to be entirely free of columns. The roof plane, and this is a good view showing somewhat of the elements of the structure under construction, obviously. The roof plane is supported by four great steel girders spanning 120 feet and placed 60 feet on centers apart. The large hall is 20 feet in height and houses the drafting spaces, an exhibition hall, and a reception area. I assure you it doesn't look this pristine now, with all the, the classrooms and the students in it. The center part, as I spoke of, within this space behind that wall, in front of that wood wall, is our exhibition area. To the right is an entrance off to the south, and the studio classes are around with the offices on the opposite side of this wall and within a core. Now the, uh, the, the spaces around the open area um, allotted to the drafting areas are separated one from the other by storage elements, not at all full height, the same height as this, uh, which provide additional exhibition wall space. And the basement contains workshops and studios for the Institute of Design and storage and services for all three of us. Crown Hall was dedicated in February of 1956. 
One of the principal speakers at the occasion was the late Ariel Saarinen, himself a significant architect and the son of Eliel Saarinen, founder of the Cranbrook, Cranbrook Academy. What he said concerning the architectural heritage of Chicago, the spirit of which Mies, the spirit of the architectural heritage of which Mies has carried on, the attitude of those who gave Mies the opportunity to develop the building itself, and of Mies as a man and architect, was spoken with such warm sincerity and deep insight that I feel it worthy of quoting and completing this talk on Mies almost in its entirety. It's most appropriate. Saarinen says, ever since the fire, ever since the fire, Chicago has excelled in giving bold, imaginative builders an opportunity. Seventy years ago, now 80, the world's first steel frame skyscraper was built here in Chicago, the home insurance building by Jenny. In 1885 it was. The city's energy and vitality attracted daring men. The gap between engineering and architecture began to close. There were important innovations. There were the great builders, such as Jenny, who did that first building, and this, the second lighter building, now Sears and Roebuck. Burnham and Root, who did the Reliance Building in 1894. And Root, who did the Monadnock Building. These were the great builders. And then the great artists, Sullivan, Carson Perry, Scott Building, and Wright, the Roby House. They all found their chance here and began to change the face of the city. It is against this background that the brass of RIT chose Mies van der Rohe of Berlin, Germany, to come here and to teach and perhaps to build. And by this act, they placed the next rung on the ladder of Chicago's architectural history. Through this addition to the third great artist, of the third great artist, rather, to the Chicago School, and through the opportunities they have given him, they have ensured the city's position as the center of the universe in modern architecture. Saarinen continues, the same bold spirit that created the Chicago architectural tradition motivated the creation of this new campus. Twenty years ago, this was a slum. This transformation could have happened nowhere else. Not because there aren't slums in many other cities. They certainly do exist in one form or another in other places. But because Chicago, because Chicago is a place of courageous thinking, a slum gives away to a brand new campus crisp and clean and beautiful and harmonious, a model of a total environment about to become a reality. <clears throat> a model of a total environment is perhaps the most necessary contribution at this period in history. Our cities are going through a transition from one civilization to another, and their physical aspects are complete anarchy. We hardly know anymore what harmonious surroundings are. But this is even more than a beautiful total environment replacing a slum. It is an environment truly of our time. He says that the Architectural Forum said, the best architectural expression of a technical college in the world. I would say, continues Saarinen, it is the best expression of a whole culture that is growing out of a technical civilization. These buildings are built on one great principle. 
that architecture should be a part of our time and the teaching of our time should be expressed in every building decision from the overall concept to the smallest detail. Such an ordered expression of our time and such a development of technology into art gives us faith and encouragement and gives us a cornerstone on which we can build a culture. Then I want to say a word about this particular building. It is fitting that in this city, architecture should be taught in the proudest building on this campus. It is time that architectural education came out of the dingy attics of the past into this serene temple of the present. It is also fitting and almost symbolic that city planning and industrial design are placed under one roof, literally under one roof, with architecture, which is where they belong and where each can benefit by association with the others. <clears throat> I have talked about the architectural traditions of this city. I have talked about the total environment of this campus. And I have talked about this particular building. And by showing how this architecture is an expression of our technologically oriented civilization, I have indicated its universality. But today, when so much stress is laid on the common denominator, on teamwork, on a vernacular, on the impersonal, we tend to forget the importance of the individual. Such thinking does us harm. Great architecture is both universal and individual. The individuality comes through as here at IIT is the result of a special quality. It is a quality that cannot be taught by teaching. It is a quality that can and cannot be seen in every part of this group, in the flashing, in the corners, in the materials, in the proportions, in the very placing of the buildings. This quality is the philosophy and thinking behind the whole complex. The universality comes because this is an architecture expressive of its time. But the individuality comes as the expression of one man's unique combination of faith and honesty and devotion and beliefs in architecture. In short, his moral integrity. Great architecture is always informed by one man's thinking. We can borrow and build on someone else's philosophy, and we can finally perhaps evolve one our own. But the important lesson is the absolute necessity of having a philosophy, or as Mies calls it, a spiritual orientation. The moral fiber of this man can be a measuring rod and inspiration that we can carry through our lives. His singleness of purpose, his complete devotion and almost religious dedication to the very best in architecture can be a touchstone for all of us. Thank you very much.